Uh, and uh, this recording will be available in this NBEL project uh, website. And uh, uh, I first start with this uh, brief introduction and welcome. And then we have a, a presentation by Professor Mikkel Sofia from Finnish Meteorological Institute about monitoring and prediction of fires and fire smoke at multiple scales. Then we have combined the presentation together with Dr. Camilla Anderson and Professor Bertie Forsberry about exposure and health effects of the forest fires in Sweden in 2018. And then uh, we have a presentation by Dr. Shang Shu Crowley from Cicero, and he will talk about quantifying health impacts from forest fires in Europe for present and future scenarios. And I propose that uh, we will have short questions uh, uh, after each uh, presentation. So please use your hand up. Uh, possibilities in teams and then at the end we could have uh, also some uh, concluding remarks or discussions and uh, about uh, the topic uh, overhaul. So first uh, I would like uh, to present then uh, Dr. and uh, Professor Mikali Sofiev. I stop sharing then you can start it and meanwhile if you do that uh, I tell the others like uh, Mikhail is a research professor in Finnish Meteorological Hydrologic Institute and also a Duke professor at the University of Helsinki. He has focused in development and application of air pollution models and related topics. Professor Sofia is a co-chair of World Meteorological Organization Scientific Advisory Group of Applications, member of a Double Show Technical Advisory Group, Steering Group of uh, World Meteorological Institute of Global Vegetation Fires, Smoke Pollution Warning and Assessment Systems, also part of Lands and Countdown, and he's author almost 200 uh, scientific uh, articles. So, Mikhail, floor is yours, and you can uh, tell the others about uh, fire smoke prediction and monitoring. Okay, thank you, Hans. Uh, hello, everyone. So long introduction, didn't know that I have so many numbers, but thanks for pulling them all together. So let's talk about fires, uh, warming up a little bit. <clears throat> so I'll start from just some gen general overview to set the terms and then switch to a more detailed uh, analysis of fire observations, what we see, what we do not see, what we know, what we don't know, and the uh, uh, last part of uh, my presentation will be mostly about fire forecasting model, our current uh, fancy toy, uh, which we are trying to develop, and where seems to be some quite interesting things are emerging. And a, a few words I'll say also about uh, past and future and some trends, uh, but I, I know that there will be presentations after, after mine about those topics. So switching uh, quickly, I understand that uh, people who are sitting now in auditorium know about that, but just to set a few general terms. So uh, first of all, uh, vegetation fires, it's a natural phenomenon, but it is severely modulated by anthropogenic forcing. So it is part of ecosystem, uh, but we turned it into something really anthropogenic. So now from many standpoints, it can be considered as an anthropogenic uh, source. It's also quite poorly known, despite whatever we know about it. We always say about every phenomenon that we still know insufficiently. Uh, the observations are comparatively well established, uh, but uh, there are usual issues for satellites. I kind of saying uh, between the lines here that in situ fire monitoring is very scarce and is available only in a few countries who managed to establish a regular network about that. But when we think about uh, large scale, global scale, basically the only information should have comes from satellites. So uh, first of all, the satellites uh, can give two types of products for us about fires. First, fire is a hot source. So in infrared channel, we can see the heat release from uh, ongoing fires. 
And second, uh, when the vegetation is burned, it turns from green to brown or to uh, blackish colors. So we can see in contrast the burnt area. These are two different products. Uh, they each of them has own pros and cons, and there are some uh, people who prefer one of one or the other. Uh, but when we look into satellites, the low orbit satellites, the ones which provide us the global coverage and pretty high resolution, uh, they suffer from representativeness error. The satellite gives us like two to four pictures during a day. And if during that moment of the overpass there, had, uh, there happened to be cloudness, that's it, thank you, see you tomorrow. So the representativeness is a pretty severe issue there. For geostationary satellites, which can give picture every five to 15 minutes or 20 minutes, the, cover, uh, the coverage is the problem. All big fires in Siberia, in Canada, uh, or far south in uh, South America, uh, they are all outside the uh, good view of geostationary satellites. So that's another problem of those. Direct measurements, as I said, are rarely possible and extremely expensive. And between it, from case to case, the variability is also extreme. And that's important now to think to distinguish. One is ignition of the fire, and that is largely anthropogenic. So most of fires are now by ignited by anthropogenic, um, due to anthropogenic activities. Lightning is natural one, but it is maybe 10%. But the chances of the ignited fire to develop into a big event, that is practically almost completely an environmental issue. I'm skipping now the intervention of fire brigades for shutting down the fires. It's possible uh, when the fire is sufficiently close and reaction is possible within short time. But basically the development is the meteorology driven uh, phenomenon. Now if we look into global fire energy release, uh, that's the map <coughs> calculated over 20 years. If we sum up everything what was observed by the probably now information source number one about fires, the MODIS uh, satellite. There are two instruments on board, Aqua and Terra satellites now. So if we sum up them over 20 years, that's what we get. So there are pretty clear pictures uh, here and uh, some peculiarities which are not visible at this scale. Let's look a bit closer to this region, um, which I selected because it is not heavily populated. And you can see on this map, uh, what is shown here is the roads, road density to be more precise. Uh, but because it's not too populated, we can see every individual road here and the red dots are the cities. Uh, then if we look at fire uh, energy released during, let's say, year 2010, which was a famous uh, extra hot record setting year, with huge fires in Siberia. This was one of the burning <coughs> regions there. And we see the road network here. Well, probably the most imp impressive is this agglomerate of roads uh, distrib uh, distributing some a decent amount of passenger and cargo traffic in Siberia. And we see that wherever roads are dense and population is dense, but not too dense, big cities are not visible here but the roads are visible. So fires are started where people can reach in two words. But if we compare it with the year 2018, the same picture, same period, same uh, different year, not so hot, a bit more rain. We still, with some stretch of imagination, can see the road network and density of population, uh, but it's no longer <coughs> that evident and the total amount of energy is much lower. So this is the impact of weather. So once again, 90% of fires are ignited by humans. That's a takeaway message. That is agriculture practices, industry, forest industry, and some others. Land use modification, getting more into agriculture from the uh, wildland parts. Leisure and recreational activities wherever industry is not um, active. So apparently this is also an important composition, a component. Natural fire ignition, that's the only lightning. There are some other uh, met ways how fires are ignited naturally, but by far the dominant one is lightning. 
And fire propagation is driven by nature, affected by intervention. Yes, heat and wind are the key promoters, rain, humidity, key suppressors, firefighting way uh, how we control the fires. <coughs> oh, we trust. Sorry about that. I was still getting some koch uh, since last week was ill. Uh, fire mitigation in the long term, that refers on the forest management and societal development. Let's show once again this map and now look into a few other places, Europe and Asia. And please pay attention to these small areas where we can actually see the borders between the countries. We can see some landscape features like uh, mountain valleys, uh, like ridges or simply differences between the uh, legislation on fires and obeyance to the legislation. And we do see in both Asia and in Europe, we see the borders between the countries. So we do see impact of sociological part to the on the total fire map. And we also see, for instance, uh, here in China, this is uh, the most intense agricultural area there. And there is quite a lot of fires also down there, despite they are forbidden in China. But. So how to monitor all that? Uh, I showed quite a few pictures. They were obtained with uh, IS for Fire system, which combines uh, several satellites, uh, three the key ones I mentioned here, that those ones which were used for years, some online like MODIS, which is a real-time satellite, offline MISER, uh, online and offline severe, and then we have to go into emission factors, to injection profile, to go into journal variation of the fire intensity, and so on and so forth. Uh, let me show maybe uh, just as a quick uh, point that in IS for fires, we were looking after fire radiative power as the main source of information. We are not looking into a burnt area. Reason, main reason is that fire radiative power is a real-time product. We can get it basically within an hour after the satellite overpass, but the uh, uh, burnt area scar requires something like one week of accumulation of information. So if we are after forecasts, not, not really burnt area, fire radiative power is the uh, source. Uh, there are other satellites, not only MODIS now provides uh, FRP, so VIRS and SLISTER, VIRS is American satellite, SLISTER is European uh, Sentinel. There are several geostationary uh, satellites as well. A feature of ISO fires is that it has strong link to SILAM. Uh, that's a, our atmospheric composition model because emission factors, how much is released by the fire, uh, they have to be calibrated either in the laboratory or against the satellites once again. And this is how we do, we use uh, SILAM and we use inverse problem solution to get the fires. Uh, I mentioned diurnal variation and that's yet another feature of the fire. What is shown here is the ratio between daytime intensity of the fire and nighttime intensity of the fire. And what is on the Y axis is the factor you see that daytime fires in most cases at least 10 times more powerful than nighttime fires, especially case African tropical forest where we have two orders of magnitude difference between the fire intensity. And there are several satellites from where we derived the case. This uh, empty bars, uh, green bars, are just a number of fires which were analyzed to get the impact and this is the right hand axis. But basically one of <laughs> the key important uh, features of the fires is that nighttime they are very heavily suppressed, suppressed by humidity, but lo by lower wind, but also daytime, especially in Africa, they are ignited as part of agriculture practices. This is where these two orders of magnitude come from. One of challenges which the uh, fire community faces now is that MODIS served us for 20 years, but it is getting old, well, actually already got old. In fact, both satellites are now out of uh, their standard orbit, which they were able to support for 20 years. But now both satellites are out of fuel, so they are just drifting. And uh, how long they will drift is a bit of a question mark, but we have to be prepared that within the time scale of a year, maybe two, 
we will be without modis. So uh, switch to Veers is the most natural step. It is a very similar instrument to MODIS. It has uh, three times higher resolution, especially if MODIS is um, about a kilometer in uh, sub-satellite nadir vertical view. Uh, Veers is about 300 meters, a bit less than that, almost four times better than MODIS. Uh, it has certain advantages. Uh, Veers sees much more fires. Uh, but uh, also sees uh, quite a lot of non-fire cases. Industry, sun glints, uh, oil refineries, that all has to be must have volcanoes, by the way. Uh, that all has to be uh, flagged out. And it turned out that the algorithm which worked for MODIS very well, the persistent fire algorithm, so if we see fire again and again at the same spot for uh, weeks and months, just means that it is not real fire, it is something underneath there. Uh, doesn't work for Veers, unfortunately. And the second problem is just technical one. Uh, MODIS altogether is about a 50 terabytes data set. Veers is about a petabyte data set. So just downloading it is an exercise already. So some kind of packing has to be invented. Uh, we are <coughs> on the way to a reasonable packing there but um, not yet. And uh, Europe also launched uh, a satellite, Slister, it's uh, on board on, uh, on Sentinel, uh, Sentinel program. And uh, there are some technical issues there as well. But anyway, uh, the Veers and Slister are two successors of the uh, fires and Slister very recently got a daytime fire algorithm. Before that, it was only nighttime fire satellite. Uh, this information goes then further, going, going a little bit downstream. So the smoke prediction. We have fires. Uh, now let's get into smoke. I hope I convinced you that it's possible to get fire indices, uh, fire emission factors, and convert the intensity of the burn into um, amount of smoke released. And that's what we did uh, some years ago, and what is now running is 10 kilometers global fire forecasting suite, uh, which is available from uh, Silam web page. And uh, evaluation is uh, done against satellites, against Ironet, against in situ data, and for that we also combine it with other forecasts because many uh, measurements are total PM or total optical thickness. So we need also desert dust, yet another forecast of CELAM, and the global air quality forecast, which is uh, with full chemistry. So we run it with 20 kilometers over the globe. How much do we know about fires? So how well is the um, skills of fire smoke against observations? Uh, this is example for Ironet. Total AUD, left is bias, whatever is green is perfect match. And uh, right is correlation, whatever is orange, it's very good result. And this is once again total AUD, so it's not only fires, it's a combination. But what is important here, and that's one thing which we do not know yet, you see the equatorial belt where we have pretty severe underestimation. It's not because anthropogenic uh, emission underestimation, although it's also underestimated probably over there, but this is because of cloudness. So that according to our calculations, MODIS sees barely 30% of fires down there. All the rest is cloud uh, covered, obscured. So that's one of the issues. Uh, CVD helps somewhat. That's a geostationary satellite over Africa, <coughs> but it cannot do everything. Uh, for correlation situation is actually a little bit better also in the equator. But uh, otherwise, uh, we don't have much to complain. So the current observations can be considered as uh, go good enough, let's put it this way. OK, I think I skipped this one uh, just to mention that the plume rise is an important parameter of uh, fire smoke, because depending on where we position it in the altitude, we will get um, uh, more or less uh, distance of the transport and the longevity of the smoke. And that is also has some reverberations to climate, of course. So uh, this is the algorithm which we have in the eyes for fires. Uh, there are other algorithms for 
compared in a very recent paper, which brought together uh, three different algorithms, and we were trying to compare it for some special uh, cases in, uh, in the US. Uh, the result was uh, actually pretty promising, and uh, we were uh, quite happy that in the scatter plot, the red triangles here are the IS profiles algorithm. Uh, it was actually managed to avoid uh, the underestimation of the plume height with regard to uh, Calypso. So the IS profiles actually show very stable uh, performance in that case as well. The value of the plume rise is shown in, in here. So you see the difference between the different algorithms and the vertical uh, amount of smoke. And you can see that uh, some algorithms prefer to put more smoke in the boundary layer. Some prefer to put it at uh, just above the boundary layer at three, four kilometers altitude. Some others bring it even higher. And the re redistribution is pretty substantial. And that is, uh, once again, climate effect, longevity of the smoke in the atmosphere, and also health effects, of course, whatever is in the boundary layer, that's what we breathe. And from that, uh, we jump to the uh, already mentioned today, Lancet Countdown, which is the global uh, health assessment, which is using some something like 100 uh, different indicators and fire smoke indicator exposure is one of those. So we provided this assessment for a uh, Lancet countdown. And what is at the top is mean yearly PM fine exposure from fires, uh, which is uh, this MODIS period, and it's calculated based on the fields which I showed before. And this is quite standard. I mean, if you recall uh, the fires where they burn, yes, this is how the smoke would look like, plus the transport, of course. But what is more interesting and less trivial is the bottom map, which is a trend over these 20 years. And here uh, we should admit that uh, our um, press-based intuition actually is contradicting to what uh, satellites see. Let's take Europe, where satellites say that there is no trend in fire intensity over these 20 years. Yes, we do see the trend in fire danger, but it does not transform into fire intensity. So actually our mitigation um, efforts in Europe do pay off. So there is no trend during the last 20 years. In fact, there is some downward trend in some parts of it. Where trend is upward is Siberia, of course. We saw that, and here our uh, press and uh, journalists do a good job in showing that trend. And <coughs> there is big trend in the in the US and Canada. There is downward series of downward trends, uh, some of them for good, some of them for bad reasons. One example of a good reason is Alaska, where uh, seemingly the firefighting activities uh, seem to work. Uh, the bad reason uh, may be in uh, Latin America, where uh, fires are also going down. Reason being, there is not much left to burn, unfortunately. So th this is a, a different thing. And yes, I did not mention um, in Persian Gulf, that's not really fires, that's uh, smoke and uh, heat coming from oil refineries. From here, we can say that uh, oil business goes, goes pretty well down there. Uh, now, let me jump in remaining five minutes to fire forecasting. And once again, recalling this number, this is a natural phenomenon modulated by anthropogenic forcing. We can predict weather, but how to predict anthropogenic forcing? So if we think now, uh, just close our eyes tightly and try to make a fire prediction model for every region or for every comparatively small region, let's say 100 by 100, 200 by 200 kilometers, where we can hope that sociological par, uh, situation is homogeneous, and then we predict weather, assuming that within that grid cell, the sensitivity to weather will be dictated by the society and it's homogeneous over that period. So then we can take lightning data to get natural phenomenon part. We get fire observations from MODIS, we get weather data, we put it all into machine learning, and we get the prediction model. 
after some uh, tinkering, and then we get uh, fires in future or distant past where we don't have observations. I should say that simple machine learning doesn't work, uh, meaning that all most of these uh, statistical tools which are used for predicting, they silently or not very silently assume normally distributed data, by no means case the fire, stationary process by no means fulfilled, ergodic no, near linear dependence also no. So all assumptions uh, explicitly or implicitly taken by the forecasting uh, machine learning algorithms and really not fulfilled in this particular case. So we have to go into some very tedious work on transforming the data to get the problem features compatible with the instruments which we use. So what I'm going to show is the results of not a standard machine learning, but some pretty, pretty complicated series of transformations of the data followed by the uh, regression system. I skip this part. So, Dropping all the technicalities, uh, showing a couple of examples at the end of the presentation. We took 20 years of MODIS, we constructed the uh, machine learning algorithm. We took 15 years for training the algorithm and took last five years for testing it. That's actually one of good examples of uh, how the system works. And it's also a very difficult one. It's Scandinavia, fires are rare here. And uh, you see there are years with big fires. Yeah, I should say that red dots here are MODIS observations. Blue dots here are MODIS detection limit. So whatever is below this blue dot at that particular day means MODIS cannot see it because of clouds, because of sensitivity of the instrument, etc. Uh, but the red dots are what, we, what it actually saw. And the uh, brown lines are what, predict, what was predicted by the uh, fire forecasting model. So we trained it over 15 years, we let it for testing, and during training there were years with low uh, fire danger in Scandinavia, so there were no real fires, you see it here. System was trained not to show them, and in the testing period there was only one year with big fires and we happy to capture it, so we were really happy to see that result in the testing mode. A little bit more in depth, uh, zooming into some uh, some other region that's Central Europe now. You see the uh, location in the title. And three years, uh, once again, MODIS uh, fires observed, the red ones, detection limit and fire prediction of the system. I picked this example to show you this line. You see at the beginning there are several fires which were not predicted by the system or pretty severely underpredicted. The trick is that here this uh, prediction was made by the system which was trained without lightning. If we add lightning, this is now with lightning as a precursor, we all of a sudden see that the season was actually started by several thunderstorms, which we were able to predict as soon as we include them into the uh, predictive uh, variables. The rest of the season that was comparatively well captured once again. So having this uh, kind of assessment for the whole globe, uh, we switched to future scenarios, and that's probably the last slide which I'm going to show. So the IS for Fires fire forecasting model was run till the end of the century, taking the community earth system model from Norway uh, meteorology for three scenarios, SSP, 1 to 6, that's 1.5 degrees uh, forecast, 2 for 5, that's 2 degrees, and 3, 7 is closer to 4 degrees uh, prediction. Uh, that's the time series which we got. Uh, this is uh, Northern Europe now, it's not too far from Helsinki actually. Uh, and the important message is that until the end of the century, middle of the century, there is no big difference between these ones. Not every year, as we saw in the example, before, in the past, in the future, there will be not every year fires. In some scenarios, they go more frequent and some less. But where we do see the problems is towards the end of the century, when in case of uh, blue lines, that's this uh, four degrees scenario, where we every year have quite long fire season. So that is uh, what is predicted by that system, if we take into that scenario. 
So I think this is summary now, and I stop here, but probably I will keep this picture on the screen. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mikhail, for this uh, great uh, presentation and keeping the time. Uh, does anybody have a question on what was presented? So may maybe then I ask uh, just very uh, complicated question. How, how much uh, this data has been used or how much, uh, let's say, decision makers uh, ask you those kinds of predictions and how they have implemented this in the work? Uh, sorry, Hans, once again, please, I was reading chat. There is a comment <laughs> down there. Uh -huh, there is a comment down, OK. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I was asking how much, uh, in your experience, decision makers have uh, used your predictions and how this has been used. Uh, it has been uh, put into several connections. Uh, first of all, OK, as we are part of this WMO fire warning and advisory center or system, which is being established. So this is one of the topics uh, where the recognition is coming. Uh, the monitoring part of IS for Fires is provided uh, to, uh, let's say, in Finland, it is used by rescue services and uh, our operational uh, folks who also uh, use it there. The climatological part, uh, this is the result of exhaustion and heat cost projects, and it's pretty fresh results, so I doubt they are used anywhere for now. Uh, but the steam is is being gathered, so it is it is on the way. Uh, I, I would say that the, this topic is only starting developing, and, and full understanding is only coming. And I should warn, I said it, but maybe I should repeat it once again, that fires is not just an immediate enemy; it is part of the natural ecosystem life as well. It is very severely altered by anthropogenic activities, and this is where we should step up. Uh, but uh, eliminating all fires has been tried and resulted in very devastating uh, outcome. It was tried in, in America, where the fires were extinguished for some time as quickly as possible, which resulted in accumulation of fuel in foods, in, uh, in just dry wood in forests, and after a few years, the fires became so big that the, their extinguishing was no longer possible. So it has to be taken with care and uh, uh, fire management does not mean firefighting. It is forest management, it is agriculture practices, it is forestry practices, which are the most important ones. And yes, thank you for the uh, comment in the chat. Uh, it really depends how they looked into uh, trends, how it was taken. I will look in very detail in this uh, paper. I'm familiar with several upward trends, uh, assessments in several communications. Uh, well, each of them has some assumptions which are or are not fulfilled. So it's always a question uh, how it is organized. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you, Mikhail. And let's uh, now move to Sweden and what happened in 2018. So maybe Camilla, uh, you start first. And Camilla is a docent and senior researcher at the Swedish Meteorological Technology Institute and also Swedish focal point alternative in IPCC. And her research has focused on air pollution exposure modeling and its impact on health, ecosystems and climate. She has authored over uh, 50 scientific articles and is a steering committee member of uh, Actris Sweden and, uh, and also MFF uh, GDA D under World Meteorolo Meteorological Organization. <laughs> Thank you, Hans, and sorry for the long introduction that you had to read. <laughs> no, it's fine. I made it shorter even. <laughs> OK, good. Excellent. Uh, so thank you for, for allowing me to, to join today to talk a bit about this project uh, and the results that we've been working on. So it's a joint collaboration between Umeå University and us at Swedish Met Office. Uh, and actually, thank you also to Mikhail for 
for uh, talking a bit also about Scandinavia and, and the peak that you saw in his picture showed uh, the very high uh, emissions or, or the, the fires that occurred in, in this specific year, 2018, that we've been focusing on in, in our work in, for this project. Uh, so in this project, we worked on looking at air pollution exposure from uh, the big wildfires that occurred in 2018 in central Sweden, and also on looking at the uh, in an epidemiological study and health impact assessment connected to that. And I will start by a presentation on the exposure modeling part, and then Bertil will continue with health impact. Uh, or health uh, part of, of the presentation. So this is just to show you a, an overview. So in 2018, in the area of Jämtland, Herjedalen, there were some very big fires in, in central Sweden. Uh, but of course, there were also fires all across Europe uh, in this year. Um, uh, related to this fire then, uh, we had two uh, research questions that also have led to scientific papers, and, and we, I will talk about those two now. So the first is, uh, the research question is, did the population exposure to the 2018 wildfire smoke affect human health in this county of Jämtland in central Sweden? And the second is, what are the potential health, health impacts, considering a scenario with most intense plume from this wildfire episode, uh, if that would affect a larger city than, than uh, what was actually hit by this plume. So for the EPI study, uh, so we uh, very quickly ran into some problems. So there were actually no urban background observations uh, of PM2.5 in the municipalities of this area in, in the summer of 2018, and only one regional background site. However, there were quite a few visibility observations, so that uh, was something we could use for evaluation. Uh, so in order to uh, estimate exposure, we had to turn towards modeling. And luckily, that's what we are doing a lot at the Swedish Met Office, SMOI. Um, so for this, we use the model we usually use here, the MATCH model. It's an Eulerian uh, CTM, chemistry transport model. Uh, we used anthropogenic emissions and uh, GFAS emissions of, of wildfires. Uh, and you can see some technical details in, in this slide. The metrological forcing was from the ECMWF IFS. We used a grid covering Europe on 12 kilometer resolution and then a nest towards four kilometer resolution covering Scandinavia. And included in this simulation, we had primary and secondary PM uh, formation and transport, uh, including uh, BBS SUA formation. Yeah, that's a bit of the technical stuff, but now I get into the results immediately, uh, very quickly. Um, so in this slide, I show you how the time series on the left hand side, you can see the time series of daily wildfire emissions uh, from June to August in 2018. And you can see there were some emissions in already in June and, and beginning of July, but the major emissions were centered around 18th to 20th of July in 2018. And on the right hand side, you see some daily uh, maximum plumes of PM2 and a half. So you can see that the plume where it hits varies and the concentration levels varies by time. So uh, this is the grid uh, with the maximum plume shown as a map. So the map maximum PM2.5 hourly value throughout the whole period uh, has been uh, put together in this picture. And you can also see in blue the different observation sites. So I don't know if you can see my uh, 
the mouse indicator, but in the uh, in the lower or middle part of the grid, we can see the largest uh, plumes from the fire of, of the PM2.5 uh, smoke uh, is close to the Dravagen and Sveg area. And Sveg is a, is a small town. The major city in this area is Östersund. It's in the middle towards uh, the higher <laughs> part of the picture. Uh, and the observation site of PM2.5 in the, is in the very top, Bredkjälen. Uh, so it's quite far away from the actual uh, fire plume. Uh, so we wanted to use this visibility to see how we managed to capture the variation due to wildfire closer to the fires uh, by using visibility observations as well. So first of all, looking into evaluation of PM2.5 in this site far from the fires. Um, so in, the, in black, you can see the, the observations of PM2.5. In, in the yellow, you can see the total PM2.5, uh, where we have a peak around the 19th, 20th of uh, July. Um, and then in brown, <laughs> dark orange maybe, uh, you can see without wildfires. So the, the main wildfire contribution is around that time in the model. However, this is not included in, in or you cannot see that same peak in the observations. So we're not exact, exactly capturing that in that very far away from, from uh, the fire center. Um, However, looking into visibility, we, we can see that in the bottom of the of the, our grid or closer to the major fires, we perform much better with a better correla correlation uh, than far further away from the fires. So, so we considered this. Uh, to be good enough, at least, uh, for doing this exposure uh, modeling and epi study. Uh, so we calculated population exposure using uh, population data, uh, and and we can see that the highest exposure was seen in the southern parts of the grid, as expected, uh, with up to 86. Uh, micrograms per cubic uh, meter in Berg uh, municipality and lower in Östersund. So this was then used by Bertil and he will talk a bit about what this means in terms of health impacts uh, for, for the municipalities. But before that, I will just quickly talk also about the second study. So we also used it this data for a scenario study. Uh, so we looked at what if these fires uh, would have happened closer to a major town or, or a larger city, uh, Östersund, and that has turned into another paper. Uh, you can look more into that if you want in afterwards. Uh, so we constructed two scenarios. One, if the population of Östersund, uh, the town, was to be shifted to the place of Sveg. Uh, so this Sveg is a town closer to the major fires. And the second scenario was uh, if the, the highest value or the, the most adverse plume would affect Östersund directly. So in that case, we shifted the population of Östersund to the maximum of the plume. But Bertil will talk more about this, but this is how, how the corresponding plumes would look for, for the two cases. The middle is the first scenario and the right hand side is the second. OK, thank you. And I think we will we'll wait with the questions for now and maybe at the end after Bertil uh, can go for if anyone has any. Thanks, Betty.
And uh, yes, I agree that uh, let's take questions after Bertie's uh, presentation. And Bertie Forsberg is a professor of environmental medicine at UMA University, and his special focus has been on health effects of air pollution risk factors for respiratory disease and also extreme temperatures. He's author of more than 300 scientific publications, has been also advisor in but uh, health organization as well as uh, several Swedish agencies. So please go, Bertel. Thank you very much, uh, Hans, for asking us to present a bit about our small studies uh, dealing with the situation in 2018. Uh, since I'm going to be uh, very brief, uh, I also, as Camilla, uh, ask you to go to the published papers for, for um, uh, detail. <clears throat> uh, when in 2018 we were about to study if there had been any effect on health, the state of knowledge was uh, shown in a review uh, published uh, that year. Uh, most studies on uh, uh, particles from wildfires deal with the short-term effects and uh, according to this review paper there were uh, uh, a lot of studies on respiratory morbidity, a lot of studies on asthma and very strong evidence for an effect of wildfire smoke on, on that kind of morbidity. Strong evidence also that all cause mortality, that is the daily number of deaths uh, uh, is affected by uh, uh, particles from wildfires. But inconclusive uh, evidence uh, when it comes to cardiovascular mor morbidity uh, that has changed now, I could say. There, there are more studies today on cardiovascular effects. The epidemiological study, the first study we performed, uh, uh, for that study we collected daily data from uh, the only hospital in this region, Östersund, and from all primary health care centers in the eight municipalities. Uh, from the hospital we could have data on emergency room visits because as an emergency department in the hospital. The healthcare centers, they are usually open only on weekdays. Uh, and from those, we could have acute visit, that, that is visits for respiratory disease uh, that were not scheduled, so unplanned visits. We collected uh, diagnosed data on uh, visits for all respiratory diseases, uh, ICD-10, uh, J0 to 99. Uh, we also, uh, for comparison, collected information on all calls to the uh, nurse uh, advisory service, Elva in Sweden, concerning breathing problems. And we collected data, there are tourists in this reading, we collected data only on registered residents uh, of these eight municipalities, and we aggregated data to to each municipality, depending on where people were living. Uh, this is a specially populated region. That means that the daily numbers uh, uh, of diagnosis or, or patients, uh, acute patients, are very small. If you look at uh, Östersund, the, the only larger urbanization in this region, there's still very few uh, visits. Uh, for, for example, for, for asthma, the average number is 1.33 acute uh, visits per, per day. And uh, for lower airways, it's 3.5. So it's, it's small numbers. For, for uh, the, smaller, uh, the smallest uh, municipality, it's, it's, it's only a few per week. So th this is a rather tricky situation for, for an epi study. Uh, for the analysis, uh, we did two types of, of uh, studies. We, we had this gridded model concentration, that is the, 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 the population weighted concentrations uh, for each day. And we focused uh, uh, mainly on the daily one or maximum PM2.5 exposure. Uh, for one, uh, way of analyzing data, we define wood smoke uh, affected days as days uh, with a one hour maximum uh, above 20 micrograms per meter cubed. 
Uh, but we also assume that there, uh, from from previous studies where most of the effects are seen the same day as the exposure or within uh, two days. So we uh, we uh, allowed for a delay of effects up to two days, uh, which means uh, that if a day is uh, from the concentration uh, defined as as affected above uh, twenty. Uh, the next two days uh, were also included as affected days, even if they were not about 20. So you, you can see here in in the slide uh, the effect of that. That if we have if we have uh, uh, I think it's four days here first, uh, and then there's two days more included among what's seen as uh, exposed days, and that comes another day after a while. Uh, and and uh, uh, here's another day, and then there's two more days as uh, defined as, as exposed. Uh, relative risks, they were estimated adjusting for, for uh, seasonal pattern, they weak temperature and relative humidity. Uh, we also uh, performed an additional analysis to, to study uh, the shape of the exposure response curves if uh, risk seems to increase uh, in a linear manner or if there seem to be thresholds. And this we did for municipalities uh, with uh, a large enough range in the concentrations. So uh, the three day mean of the one hour maximum um, had to be above 50. If we first study this uh, analysis, which could be seen as uh, a study of the, the adjusted incidence rate. We can see, uh, of course, that the results, uh, are, uh, the confidence intervals are, are rather wide. But, uh, but if we take the meta estimates, which means that we have combined the results for all eight municipalities, uh, they are statistically significant using a 95% confidence interval. The meta estimate for the, the effect of wood smoke affected days on uh, asthma is 1.68, and uh, all visits for lower airways, uh, the, uh, the relative risk for the expo exposed days are 1.40, which are significant. There are, uh, for, for the most exposed uh, municipality, Harjedal, and also a significant effect. On, on asthma uh, with an even higher relative risk. If we move to the um, shape of the exposure response curves, uh, we study uh, trend and covariate adjusted residuals from, from the time series uh, regression. And, and we can see that uh, there is no sign that the associations uh, would not be linear uh, for the effect on uh, visits for, for lower airways, uh, which is on this slide. Uh, and the same goes for, for uh, uh, visits for asthma. Uh, and these, uh, this is uh, uh, the effect on the residuals. So it's not easy from the slide to see uh, uh, the effect in terms of, of uh, uh, relative risk or percent increase. But I, but I will come back to uh, recalculation we used for the uh, impact study. So we saw an effect on, on uh, uh, lower airways and, and asthma especially. Then we had this uh, question about the worst case, if the, the plume would have affected uh, uh, the most populated area, Östersund. And there in this uh, impact study, uh, we would like to include also other health outcomes than we had uh, in our epidemiological analysis. So we uh, included uh, effects on, on short-term effects on total mortality, where we collected the relative risk from a very large uh, study of uh, PM2.5 from, from wood smoke, uh, which uh, indicated that morta daily mortality increased uh, about 2% per 10 microgram per cubic meter increase in the, in the daily mean concentration. 
uh, for the short term effect on, on cardiovascular hospital emissions for cardiovascular disease. What happened now? Sorry. <laughs> short term effect on cardiovascular disease, it's uh, uh, 3.7% uh, per 10 micrograms per meter cube. And uh, short term effects on hospital admissions for respiratory disease, it's around 9% per 10 micrograms per meter cube from review papers. And then uh, the short term uh, effect on, on uh, uh, acute uh, visits for, for asthma, it's uh, recalculated from uh, our own data uh, with uh, in, an increase of 37% or a relative risk of 1.37 per 10 micrograms, micrograms per meter cube. Because I said that this uh, increase is, is rather high compared uh, compared to what's seen from, from other studies, I would say that the uh, typical value is around 10% per 10, 10 micrograms per meter cube. Uh, and then uh, for the impact analysis, of course, we, uh, as always uh, in health impact assessment, we need to assume a baseline. And, and uh, uh, here we have our own data where we can calculate the baseline. It's 2.10. Uh, visits per day and 100,000 inhabitants. Uh, for the other three outcomes, we could, from the National Board of Health and Welfare, collect the baseline rate ratio for this region, Jämtland, Härjedalen. Uh, and it, since it's uh, it, it's it's uh, outcomes with rather low uh, frequency, the, the numbers are quite small. Then we come to the results from this health impact assessment. And we have the two scenarios with more exposure uh, for the, the largest population. And I think with the time we have, we, we concentrate on the situation where the plume, the concentrations uh, from the plume will have hit Östersund, the, the largest uh, population in, in this region. And we could see that then we expect that there would have been one uh, uh, death more than uh, one excess death, uh, 3.5 about more cases, uh, admissions for cardiovascular disease, about one more case of uh, admissions for respiratory disease, and around 13 more uh, acute cases acute visits for, for asthma. And th this 13 could then be compared with the baseline number for the period affected by uh, wood smoke, which was 12 cases. So it, it's uh, a bit more than the doubling uh, uh, of the number of uh, uh, emergency or acute cases of, of asthma. So finally, the conclusions. Uh, our EPI study showed uh, increased numbers of visits for lower airways, including uh, asthma, which uh, goes into to the category lower airway disease. Uh, the relative risk we saw was uh, high per 10 micrograms uh, per, per cubic meter of PM2.5 in comparison with uh, what we have seen from other studies of uh, PM2.5 from, from wildfires. And those studies generally indicate stronger effects of such PM2.5 than PM2.5 in general. Uh, we could also say that this short period of exposure of a small population resulted in a rather few excess cases, also in, in our impact worst scenario. And uh, we could also add that uh, we study here the, the short-term effects of, of, of local, so to say local emissions. It might be that for a country like Sweden and this region, long-range transported uh, wildfire smoke may be a bigger health problem if we would do a similar uh, health impact calculation using uh, model data for 
PM uh, in transported PM 2.5. So, thank you. And now I think we could let you ask Camilla and me questions about our small studies. No questions? Uh, uh, yeah, the, we have a couple of questions. Very nice. That Tatiana is first. Uh, hello, I'm Mat Tatiana. Matiana, yeah. Yes, I'm from Croatia. Uh, and uh, since we have similar, 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 not similar uh, regarding to the wildfires, but we, uh, thanks to the EU funds, we developed some innovative uh, modeling tools for indoor air quality for urban areas. My question is more of technical, how do you deal up there uh, when you develop some model, in this case for fire, uh, uh, wood fire, how do you deal with the uh, promotion of that innovations uh, uh, in, to introduce them to the decision makers? We now challenge in Croatia, we develop, developed some innovative tool for health impact assessment, but we struggle with, of course, how to introduce that uh, to the decision makers because it's very hard when you have high level of PMs and you have to put the early warning for, for the population in web GIS, like, please take care, do not uh, perform intensive physical activities in the outdoor. We still here in Croatia, but I think in all Southern Europe or Middle is Central Europe, we struggle with that part of communication. So basically, we, we develop something innovative and then we have a problem. It would be comforting if you say that you also struggle with the same things, I hope. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we could say that in a way we are better off, but we have, from our side, we have uh, been within uh, uh, Acrobear, our, our uh, project, we have uh, initiated some some uh, discussions in focus groups and presented our results in in the concerned region in Jämtland, Härjedalen. But but we have also been invited to to write about this problem with the wildfires and and uh, potential health risks, both in a report for the Swedish Environmental agency and yesterday uh, the two last days i i participated in uh, uh, activity for the national public health authority on climate change and health and we we, we discussed uh, uh, wildfires and and, and potential uh, increase in the in in, in the uh, or an increase in the potential for wildfires I, I should say and what that means uh, from health point of view so I think it. What do you say, Camila? I think there there uh, there is at least some interest for these results. <laughs> yes, I, I can maybe I can uh, add a few things. I totally agree. Uh, we are in a good spot. Um, uh, we've also been working for both you, Bertil, and I, and and others have been working together with the Swedish EPA for many years to. Uh, sort of understand where we're going and and uh, what is needed from the decision makers. I think it's a good thing to work together with these people who, who are closer to the decision makers um, and and those who also uh, think things that are supposed to be reported to the EU, for instance. So from our side, we've developed a uh, uh, a web service called Luftweb, which is directly translated to air web <laughs> or air internet uh, web page. And, and in that place, we try to collect different uh, services that can be of interest to decision makers. Um, and I think in the long run, we would also like to make similar things as you suggest having sort of warnings or, or messages to the public on higher levels, but that's sort of not done uh, at this point for, for this type of situation in Sweden. Um, so there's still some few things to do, but uh, yeah, I agree. 
maybe regarding warnings, we could say that we have also advised the authorities to have some capacity to measure the concentrations in, in, in uh, remote areas where there are no um, monitoring stations. So, so they could move equipment to areas which for a couple of weeks may be affected by high concentrations. And that, that's also to make it possible to, to have decisions and warn people when, with respect to the concentrations. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Christine. Hi, thanks for a really interesting talk, uh, Bertil. Um, you have been uh, working on this topic for many years. I wonder if you could say something about your, what you think about the, or you know about different toxicity of wildfire particles versus average PM 2.5 urban PM 2.5. I mean, there's some uh, indications that wildfire emissions might be more toxic. Others say maybe not. <laughs> so what is your take on that question? Well, I would say that uh, the outcome where we have most information from uh, wildfire smoke uh, exposed population, that, that that's uh, respiratory morbidity and uh, emergency room visits for asthma and so on. And, and there, the uh, relative risks are, are much bigger for wood smoke PM 2.5 than for PM 2.5 in general. So, so there it seems to be at least more toxic than typical PM 2.5. Then I know there are studies uh, trying to, to differentiate the effects from, so to say, fresh uh, wood smoke PM 2.5 and, and uh, PM 2.5 that 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 uh, is aged and and there seem to be differences, but I have seen results in both phases. But but uh, I think the conclusion is that fresh wood smoke is seem to be more toxic than uh, particles that have aged someday. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you for this. And now let's move to the final presentation by Xiorangshu Kravati, uh, who will talk about scenarios and he's a senior researcher at uh, CICERO Center for International Climate R Research. He's an anthropogenic scientist researching air pollution, heat stress and human health. He focuses on modeling air pollutant and heat using chemistry climate models and satellite and assessing their effects on human health with a focus on identifying viable interventions to avoid these effects. So floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, well, so uh, I will talk a bit on uh, contribution of wildfires to annual ambient air pollution and related excess states, present status and future projections. So. I'll use uh, most of the outputs that Mikhail and his group produced and Mikhail presented in his talk. So I'll not go too much into the methods, uh, rather I'll be very uh, short with my methods and then discuss more the results. Um, same with introduction, I'll not uh, say a lot because um, Mikhail already mentioned um, uh, many things, many important things. Uh, so. Uh, very briefly, we know that climate change uh, affects air pollution. It alters meteorological factors, and uh, you know is is expected to result in increase in ground level ozone or particulate matter, and um, in many locations worldwide. And the main effect of meteorological factors, as we know, is on natural emissions and wildfires. Now, over the past decade. Um, we have seen that there has been a surge in incidences of large and uncontrolled fires in all vegetated continents. Uh, the wildfire seasons have lengthened in many areas uh, due to warmer springs, longer summer, uh, dry seasons, and you know drier soils and vegetations. Now, what happens with wildfires? It you know it emits lots of uh, fine particulates into the air. And as you see, uh, this is uh, Berkeley on a clear day, and then Berkeley after a, a you know a, a big uh, forest fire event uh, upstream. 
So you see that uh, these these very small particles are, uh, are are emitted into the air and they stay into the air in the air for long periods of time. And these are so small particles that they uh, that they reflect away the blue uh, part of the spectrum, and you just see the orange lights. Uh, and and as Bertil uh, mentioned, and uh, as Christine's uh, question was um, you know uh, was was answered, that wildfires uh, may result in a range of uh, health issues, including respiratory and cardiovascular endpoints, and emissions from wildfires can be more toxic as compared to other sources. So we'll do uh, some assumptions um, on these as well. Um, so the objective of what I'll present is to quantify the contribution of wildfires on long term air pollution exposure and chronic impacts on human health for the present and future scenarios. You have already seen how uh, it, it increases the risk of mortality uh, uh, or respiratory uh, diseases and hospital visits for short term or acute uh, exposure. Now we are talking about um, you know, chronic impacts. Uh, so I'll be very brief. Uh, we use the fire emissions that were generated by Mikhail's group. So these are the newly developed fire forecasting model, which produces fire emissions uh, beyond the modis modest lifetime. Uh, we used anthropogenic um, emissions from SEDS, uh, which includes all other sectors, including industries, domestic uh, solid fuel use, uh, domestic energy generation, power generation, and agricultural activities. All, all these emissions were fed into the uh, global chemical transport model CLAM, which Mikhail mentioned in brief, and the resulting outputs uh, were at uh, 2 cross 2 degree horizontal resolution globally and at 20 kilometer over Europe from 1990 to 2100 and under three scenarios, which are SSP 126, SSP 245 and SSP 370, and they were used for health impact assessment. Uh, well, so now using the results uh, from the CLAM model, we find uh, that the global population weighted PM 2.5, which are the blue lines um, and, and represented by the blue Y axis. So they have increased from 34 microgram per meter cube in 1990 to uh, 50 micrograms per meter cube in 2017. And in the same period, population weighted forest fire related PM 2.5 has increased from 0.24 microgram per meter cube to 0.41 microgram per meter cube. And remember, these are global numbers. There are wide differences across the regions, which I'll come to in the next few slides. Uh, now, these, these, uh, you know, the red uh, y-axis, these represent the fire PM 2.5, and they might seem to be very minimal in, you know, in comparison to some other major sources like uh, um, domestic energy or transportation. Uh, but we'll see in the following slides that forest fires may be leading sources of uh, PM 2.5 in certain parts of the globe. Now. Uh, Looking at uh, contribution of wildfires to PM 2.5 exposure, the panel on the left provides a snapshot of spatial distribution of population weighted PM 2.5 in 1990 and down here for 2017. And as you see, PM 2.5 has increased, um, our population weighted PM 2.5 has increased in most of the developing parts of the world in the global south. While it has decreased um, in this time period, um, in, in the developed countries in Europe, in uh, North America, it has decreased. And the panel to the right provides a snapshot of uh, uh, spatial distribution of contribution of forest fires to population weighted um, uh, PM 2.5 exposure in 1990 and 2017. Uh, so what we see that while, while anthropogenic sources of PM 2.5 has been decreasing over most of these developing uh, parts of the world, like in Europe and Northern America, uh, the importance of forest fires contribution to PM 2.5 has been uh, has been increasing. And uh, now the panel uh, on the left, uh, they depict the rate of change of PM 2.5 and wildfire related PM 2.5 in microgram per meter cube per year. 
again, uh, let me clarify that these are uh, trends from 1990 until 2017. So they are different from uh, Mikha what Mikhail showed in his uh, trend figure. It was from 2003 to 2020. So we go back further long. Um, I mean, further long back in time. Uh, so uh, what we see here is that uh, though PM 2.5 uh, has decreased or has been decreasing over most of the developed parts of the world, like uh, Northern, um, Northern America and uh, in Europe, uh, forest fire uh, related or forest fire related PM 2.5 has been increasing in all over the world. And in central sub-Saharan Africa and in uh, tropical Latin America, which are like the hotspots of, uh, uh, you know, the increase, uh, we have a couple of line plots. We show that PM 2.5 in blue, as well as uh, fire PM 2.5 in red has been increasing from 1990 to 2017. Now looking at uh, the trends over Europe in further details, um, the blue lines are for PM 2.5 exposure. These are population weighted PM 2.5 exposure over all of Europe. And the red lines are percentage contribution from uh, forest fires. And uh, what we see is that PM 2.5 exposure has reduced by more than 50% over Europe from to from 1990 to 2019, and that is due to many good air pollution policies that have been implemented over Europe um, in, in, in mid-1990s and onwards. While we uh, see a rising trend in contribution of wildfires over the 30-year period, and more significantly in Eastern Europe, which are indicated by the dashed lines, uh, than in uh, Western Europe, which are uh, which are uh, thin solid lines, and Central Europe, which are dotted lines. Now, for moving um, moving on from exposure to health burden estimation. Now, for estimating excess deaths from exposure to ambient PM 2.5, besides requiring good data for PM 2.5 exposure and their sources, we also need information on baseline disease rates uh, by administrative units and by disease, population distribution, and also exposure response functions. Uh, it was uh, it was uh, talked about a bit by Bertil, but I'll say that uh, these exposure response functions are different. These are uh, for chronic impacts, and uh, we use uh, the GBD methodology, which uh, which which has produced the recent MRBRT um, exposure response curves, which are used here and. Uh, um, you know, though I should mention that recent studies have found that wildfire smoke are more harmful for human health compared to other fine particles, which are, we will, uh, which will uh, consider in a couple of next couple of slides. But uh, these exposure response functions do not take into consideration toxicity of different species. So globally, we find uh, that in 1990, about 3.1 million people uh, have died from exposure to ambient PM 2.5, and in 2017, around 4.6 million people have died from uh, exposure to ambient PM 2.5. And uh, globally, ischemic heart disease and stroke are the leading causes of deaths, followed by uh, chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary diseases, lung cancer, and type 2 diabetes. Now, globally, it can be um, seen that PM 2.5 related excess deaths, which are in blue lines, have um, uh, have increased significantly from 1990 to 2017, and that is because uh, PM 2.5 in most developing countries have uh, have have increased, and uh, these developing countries house the um, house a large proportion of the world's population. While excess deaths from forest fire PM 2.5 has also increased in this time period. Now over Europe, uh, we estimate the excess deaths from uh, all PM 2.5 to decrease, which are blue lines. Uh, 
by more than 50%. However, the excess deaths attributable to wildfires were estimated to increase by more than 100%. Now, though these are, uh, you know, small proportion of the total excess deaths from ambient PM 2.5, um, it, it is in a way counteracting policies and efforts to achieve clean air across Europe. And on the right hand side, we have the fire mortality rates, which are excess deaths from wildfires per thousand deaths from all PM 2.5. And uh, for all the countries, these rate has increased over Europe. And these are just snapshots of two, uh, two years, um, in 1990, the blue dots and 2019. Um, now, as I said, a few studies have established that forest fires may be more toxic as compared to other sources of PM 2.5, primarily uh, due to large emissions of black and organic carbon associated with them. Uh, you know, a recent study has indicated that forest fires may be 10 times more toxic as compared to other sources. So we uh, do a few sensitivity studies. We assume forest fires to be uh, two times, five times, and 10 times more toxic as compared to other sources or other um, sources of PM 2.5. And if indeed forest fires are 10 times more toxic as compared to other sources in PM 2.5, we find that uh, about 13% of total uh, PM 2.5 related excess deaths in 2019 over Europe may be attributed to wildfires. And um, about 25% of total excess deaths in Eastern Europe may be associated with wildfires in 2019. Well, so let us now see what the future holds. Uh, as Mikhail said that, um, that that his group produced projections of forest fire or wildfire emissions uh, um, across the century and for three uh, scenarios. SSP 126, 245 and 370. So these are uh, very different assumptions about uh, the way we, we can progress going into the future. So SSP 126 is a low emission uh, pathway with high mitigation. 245 is uh, middle of the road and 370 is uh, um, you know, a low mitigation, high emission pathway. Uh, and the assumptions about, uh, you know, air, air, air pollution control or um, emission control is very different. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's very good. Like air pollution control is very good in 126. Uh, it's very bad in 317. So uh, what we see uh, for uh, for Europe is that under all the three scenarios, PM 2.5 exposure is expected to decrease as compared to the present day uh, PM 2.5 exposure under all the scenarios until the end of the century. The more prominently under SSP 126 as compared to under SSP 245 and 370. While the percentage contribution from wildfires are expected to increase across the century, I mean across um, uh, Europe until end of the century and more significantly, uh, you know, under SSP 370, uh, where you don't see uh, too much in the percentage contributions that I show here because anthropogenic sources are also expected to increase hugely under SSP 370. So, uh, these are uh, excess deaths from PM 2.5 and wildfire related PM 2.5 exposure. The wildfire related PM 2.5 exposure are in dotted lines and are associated with the uh, right Y axis. Uh, so for both, both Western and East, uh, Central Europe that uh, you see here that uh, PM 2.5 related excess deaths are expected to decrease until end of the century under all the scenarios in both these regions. However, forest fire related excess deaths are expected to increase. And uh, across Europe, we see that uh, wildfire related excess deaths are projected to increase by at least six times at end of the century as compared to, uh, to 2010 to 14 under the most optimistic scenario in Europe. 
Now, uh, this figure shows the contribution of forest fires to ambient PM 2.5 related excess deaths. Um, again, under three scenarios for end of the century, and this is for uh, um, you know 2010 to 14. This is just the spatial res uh, replication of what I showed in the previous slides. Um, so you see that uh, in the present day. Uh, Wildfires are big sources in parts of uh, Latin America as well as in Sub-Saharan Africa. While under SSP 126, at the end of the century, it is expected to emerge as a large source in um, in, in Scandinavia as well as in um, in, in high-income North America. Now, putting wildfires in light of other sources, like I said, uh, that. Uh, uh, you know, well, let me explain this first. So we have anthropogenic sources in uh, blue, dark blue, uh, biogenic VOCs in light brown, dust and sea salt in green, and forest fires in dark brown. And the top uh, figure is for uh, the past. So we have 1990, 2000, and 2010. And the bottom figure is, um, is for the future 2035, 65, and 95. The dark colors are for SSP 370. The medium colors are for 245, and the light colors are for SSP 126. So you see in SSP 126, uh, though the contribution or uh, though the excess deaths from forest fires are expected to be much smaller, but uh, you know the anthropogenic contribution is also expected to be much smaller um, across uh, the century. And that is why the contribution of forest fires are much more, are expected to be, expected to be much more prominent in SSP 126 as compared to SSP uh, 370 or SSP 245. So in conclusion, wildfires are increasingly becoming an important source of PM2.5 related mortality globally and in Europe, counteracting the improvements in air quality. And if these emissions are more toxic compared to other sources, they may result in at least 13% of all excess deaths from air pollution in Europe. And wildfires are expected to result in at least six times more excess deaths in Europe compared to present day at end of the century under the most optimistic scenario. Thanks. Yes, uh, uh, yes, Shangshu. Uh, many thanks for this. Uh, yes, Bert, do you have a question already? Uh, you are muted. Sorry, thank you very much. I have two questions. Uh, first, uh, have you published this, uh, the latest results yet? But you, you uh, will. <laughs> they are under revision in a journal, um, okay. co-authored by Mikhail, uh, Christine and Risto. OK, good. My second question is, uh, do you have any opinion about uh, wildfires and ozone and the, the relation as a um, health issue? It, uh, do we not have to bother about ozone in comparison with particles? Well, uh Ozones are also very important. I mean, exposure to ozone is also very important. And we, of course, need to uh, worry about ozone as we do about uh, PM 2.5. And uh, they are also included in the global burden of diseases, or exposure to ozone and the related health effects. But the thing is that uh, the health burden from ozone is one tenth as the health burden from PM 2.5. So therefore, uh, we have not, um, or at least for now, have not uh, um, addressed that, but we have the data that uh, th that uh, that can be used to address that. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Mm, uh, th then I have a, just uh, a discussion point uh, question to everybody, especially related to Shangshu's uh, last presentation that we are expecting forest fires uh, excess deaths to increase in coming decades. So what we should do or what we can do to avoid this? Because uh, we are expecting like there will be more forest fire smoke, but uh, from a public health point, uh, we cannot accept that. 
what we could do or what we can do. Who wants to respond? I don't know, Shurank, you were last one. Yeah, so you, you can start. Yeah, I'll start and I'll follow follow up the very uh, nice discussion that uh, Mikhail had at the end of his presentation. Uh, we need uh, more uh, in a more active forest management, and it doesn't only mean that we we be just uh, stop the forest fires. We have to be, you know, it also means that we have forest lines, um, uh, you know, fire lines. Uh, we we are more effective, and it is very important to have early warning systems that are related to forest fires. Currently, they they are there in Europe, but um, and and that has that has managed to, you know, flatten out the trend from 2003 onwards uh, in increase in forest fires. Uh, however, we are missing that in other hotspots like in, in, in Africa. Uh, we do not have that in Latin America where these big forest fires are there. Uh, also, I, I, ju I just notified earlier today in a meeting that, uh, um, that, that there, was, there was very effective forest management uh, plan in Alaska, which did not allow you know, for that. We did not have big forest fires in Alaska this year. Um, yeah, so uh, that, that, that was from me. Uh, Pertil, Camilla, do you have something to add? Maybe I can just add to, to what you just said, Sorancho. Um, so for Sweden, for instance, there has been a problem over the years to turn towards more monocultural um, spruce plantations, and they've identified this as a, a problem for wildfires and, and to also include a mixture of leaf uh, species and not take those away from, from the forest. So that's one practical way forward to sort of manage an increasing risk with, with a management method, I think. But this is not my expert area, so. <laughs> Bertil or Mikhail? I, I, it's 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 not my area either what to do uh, about the uh, fire risks but I, I think that we uh, with regard to health we need to to uh, inform policymakers um, more about the, the long term exposure and the effects that we ha may have quite large effects from from wildfire uh, smoke also in areas where we 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 don't uh, see any fires or or have the fires far away and and i mean the the relative risks for for long term exposure on mortality for example is usually 10 10 or 20 times bigger than the short term coefficient so it's uh, it's a huge problem compared to what i think that that politicians and policymakers believe they they say that well maybe Sweden and Finland and that kind of countries are affected one time uh, one year in ten or so but but that's not true. <laughs> yeah, like there's a long term transportation as well yeah. of air pollution. Yeah, that's uh, actually as uh, Sranjo already said uh, referred to the forest management one thing but uh, i also would like to uh, reiterate the item connected with societal management in more general uh, fires are started by people also within recreational activities and uh, in many uh, countries where industry and agriculture are brought to sense and do not contribute to uh, fire activity recreational activities of public becomes uh, one of the most significant contributors. And uh, that is happening nearby cities and this is happening where people are. So that's uh, yet another item which, which is very important. And uh, the, the fact that we see the borders of the countries <clears throat> on the fire map is actually a direct confirmation. So I, I really would love to see the uh, fire map 
as a drought map, basically, not as political map. So that it's it's actually taken into seriously in all states and all societies and where <coughs> the uh, fire legislation is not at place, it should be at place, or forest legislation is not appropriate, and where it's at place, it should be enforced and understood by people, because that's yet another important thing. Uh, and uh, another question, like uh, it's very close to the forest fires, but uh, how about biomass burning though? Like uh, in India, there was a huge problem recently, like uh, agricultural waste burning and biomass burning. Like soon they start that spring uh, all old olive trees and wine yards, and this has to be burned in uh, April and, uh, and etc. Do you have also views on that air pollution coming from there? Yeah, so uh, if I if I just uh, start, uh, can I just start on this? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, related to the problem in India, it's it's like an very aged problem. Like it's it's been there since uh, as long as the satellite uh, history can tell us. Um, so what happens is that uh, during this part, uh, this time of the year, in the uh, end of October and mid of to mid of November, there is a lot of uh, crop burning in the northern part of India, and uh, it gets transported. Uh, the, all, all the pollutants gets transported into Delhi, right? And that's why it's so much in media. It's so much highlighted because Delhi, the capital of India, is getting affected. How's to run 25? million uh, people, but people further upstream and downstream are also being impacted. Uh, so the government of India is doing um, as much as it can to stop it. So uh, they are uh, they, they, they are uh, investing a lot of money uh, to to convert, you know, help the farmers convert these uh, biomass into biomass pellets. Uh, so there are uh, very modern machineries that are being uh, handed out to the farmers to do that. Uh, then, you know, there are other uh, things that the government is uh, promoting. There is the uh, there, there is a specific module on this on the National Clean Air Action Plan. Uh, that is uh, that is there to handle this problem, but again the thing is that uh, you know I'll just come up with a small example. So in 2019, when I was finishing my PhD, we were uh, looking at the fire map and uh, we didn't see fires at all uh, over uh, um, over Delhi, uh, over over the northern part of uh, Punjab, and then. We uh, saw that a lot of lot of smoke was getting still transported into uh, into uh, into Delhi, and then what we understood, and when we discussed this with the local NGOs in northern part of India, the farmers were still burning crops, and they were very much informed about the satellite overpass time. They were doing small burns, so that the satellites don't detect it. So you know. There is a lot that can be done, but then again, it uh, it depends on how people perceive it. You know how the policy is getting perceived by the uh, by the local uh, people. I can add that I had exactly the same story uh, when I was talking in China at some point, and at the break, one of people came to me and said, guys, don't think that farmers are stupid. They know perfectly well when Modis is above their heads. So it's forbidden in China, so they burn it so that it's not visible. Exactly the same story was there. Uh, but uh, yet another thing which I would like to mention in this connection, uh, there was a workshop in Indonesia which actually uh, started this WMO uh, series of um, uh, vegetation, fire and smoke pollution advisory systems, and uh, there there were several discussions uh, what to do with fires in Indonesia, which is uh, one of the biggest source of uh, fire smoke worldwide. And the uh, question very quickly came to the point that if the village uh, does not have tractor to clean the field after the harvest, and they cannot do it manually, they'll burn it. Yes, there is legislation forbidding it, 
But if there is no other way to get the field ready for the next seeding, uh, it will happen anyway. And uh, that uh, once again refers, yes, there is, there is a legislation, but if there is no material support for that, it will not work. And uh, uh, to a large extent, it is also uh, valid in, in China. I believe a similar thing happens in India with a vast amount of uh, agriculture related population. And uh, that's uh, yet, yet another point. So in order to do the fire management, we have to keep in mind that it's not cheap in most cases, much more expensive than just burn the stuff. Yeah, not cheap and not uh, easy. And there is a cultural uh, mm. habits and uh, yes. it's not it's not easy to change uh, the things. Uh, but uh, but we are already 10 minutes above time and uh, I also personally have to leave. So I would really like to thank you all the presenters and also all the other people that uh, were listening and uh, asked questions. And, and so on. And uh, I think that's definitely the field we have to work and as the climate uh, is changing, so the problems might also get worse. And so I, we are not expecting that the culture and uh, anthropogenic factors will change in, uh, in few years. So it takes time and we have to kind of present those results even more. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Okay, goodbye.